Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We will be starting in verse 22. Today I, talk, I want to talk to you about the will of God. I think of all the things that people ask me now, uh, this question is asked me more than any question. Uh, you know, people that are doubting their salvation, uh, that may be another one. That would come probably in second. Uh, but this is one. Brother Mike, how do I know the will of God in my life? And again, this is not my answer. This is God's answer. Listen, folks, the Word of God has every answer to every question ever asked. It's there. It's for our history. That's why we have history. You see, the difference between the world, history, and God's history, it's His, capital H, His story. Jesus is in everything. Every word, every book, every chapter, Jesus is the main character. And I am telling you, God doesn't play hide and seek with you, okay? He's not trying to fool you. He's wanting your will to line up with his will. And as we will see today, and again, I'm giving my opinion because it is split on what I have studied this week on whether Paul was in God's will or not in God's will. And my opinion is he was not in God's will. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that I have good company all right? Because I'm not the only one. That There are times in my life that I do what I want to do, not necessarily considering the perfect will of God. That's what he wants. And today, our scriptures really helps us out in that area. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, the will of God. Number one, Paul's plan. All right? Paul's plan. Paul had a plan. Folks, everybody needs a plan. Okay, everybody needs a plan. I had two opportunities to go uh, to a Bible college early in my ministry, and I believed that God at the time didn't, you know, uh, you know, offer me that, that, that doors were closed on that. And it wasn't until I was 50 years old. And folks, I was in a class. They would call me pops in the class. These young men were 20. 22, 21, 23 years old, all right? But I am telling you, I had the best time learning in that class. And my point is, even if I was wrong by not going, God still allowed me to go, even year, 25 years later. So I'm telling you, folks, Paul has a plan. I mean, God has a plan for your life. So Paul's plan, Paul's purpose. We all need purpose. You need a reason to get up. You need a reason to get dressed. You need a, re a reason uh, to put on your happy face. I like happy faces, don't you? Folks, I believe Christians ought to be the most happy people in the world. I mean, we have something others don't. We have hope, hope beyond the grave, and others don't. And number three, Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer. Paul had many prayers in his writings, but this is one that, I mean, he, he was literally begging the Roman Christians to pray for him. So let's look at this scripture. You know, Paul wrote the major part of his letter to the Roman church to teach the church doctrine. In our scripture text, he shares his heart's desire to see them face to face and have Christian fellowship with them. Paul is also making comments about his ministry and hopes for future work in the Lord, Lord's service in Rome. He tells this group of believers, most of whom he had never met and who live in a place he has never been, valuable principles to live by in your Christian walk. One of the important things in serving the Lord is being in the perfect will of God. To be in the will of God, believers must listen to God, follow the Holy Spirit in every decision they make. I'm giving you the two keys right here. That's not all there is to it, but you have to listen to to God and follow the Holy Spirit. In this epilogue, Paul testifies of the peace and joy Christians experience by doing these two things. May we follow Paul's and God's advice in our daily living as we seek the perfect will of God in our lives. So let's look at Paul's plan. Verse 22, for this reason, 
I have also been much hindered from coming to you. And again, he is talking about his 15 years of ministry. He is talking about the three missionary journeys that he had been on. He is talking about the churches that he planted. And not only planted, he, he got leadership. There was two things he did. He started a new church work in these new towns, and he stayed till he got leadership in place, solid Bible-believing leaders in place. And then he would move on to the next town. And the thing about the churches is there were different places he stayed in different lengths. Sometimes he'd only stay six months. Sometimes he'd stay a year. The most he stayed anywhere was two years. But all these churches, this is what he's saying to the Romans as he closes out the book of Romans. He's saying, this is why I haven't been there yet. He has mentioned it in early Rome, Romans in chapter 1 that he wants to go to Rome. That is a, a, a desire of his heart, and not only go to Rome and to go, to go to Spain. So we see here that was his plan to go to Rome first. And Rome uh, was on the main highway to Spain, so it wasn't something that would be hard to do. But he was finishing up the work that he gave them. And folks, you have to know when God is finished with you in a certain place. Anyone that's been in the ministry knows this. I am telling you, I've moved two times in the ministry, and both times it was extremely hard to do. My home church at Cameron Baptist Church in Lawton, Oklahoma, I'd been a member there for 36 years. I've been a, a youth minister there for 14 years. And to leave that place of where I grew up spiritually, I am telling you, was one of the most difficult decisions. We moved away from my family, and we moved 283 miles from Lori's family. Her family lived not far from us. My family lived 50 miles away. But God told me it was done. God told me we were finished. And the same thing, I was across the river at First Baptist Church of Alma. Everything is going good. There was no problems there. But God said, I have a different plan for you. And it was 19 years ago today that I accepted the call to this church. And folks, I'm... <laughs> Did I think I would be here 19 years? Honestly, I didn't. Matter of fact, the first two, I was just praying I could keep my job the first two years. It was a struggle. Anybody that was with me, it was a struggle. But folks, anything God has for good, Satan has for bad. He wants to discourage you in the ministry. He wants to tell you God's done with you. He wants to tell you that, hey, you messed up, and God's not going to give you a second chance. Folks, I thank God for second chances. And I'm telling you, I've loved it here uh, I still say this, I'm hoping God will let us three, now three, all right? Steve, and, and all, all the, the ministries here, all the leadership here in Cody, I pray that I can retire right here. Because if I can get seven more years in, folks, I'll have 50 years in the ministry. And that is a goal that I have. And I'm not saying I'm going to quit in seven years. Some of you are adding it up. I saw you, I saw you doing it. It simply means, please, Lord, just give me seven more, and then we'll see what happens. Verse 23, but now no longer have, having a place in these parts, I have a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Great desire, not just a desire, a great desire. He had this yearning in his heart to go to Rome, and to go to Spain. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. First, I may enjoy your company for a while. And that's why he wrote the letter in the first place. He'd been wanting to go there for years, and he hadn't had opportunity. It hadn't worked out. So he was thinking, just in case someone takes his life. Folks, his life was threatened many times because he preached Christ. The Judaizers hated him. They went and followed him and, and just, you know, just 
caused all kinds of problems in his life. One we are fixed, we're right now we're going to look at in Scripture. Okay, so he had that desire to go to Rome, but he had not had the opportunity. And, and here's what I want to tell you. The key to finding God's will for your life, I said before, is listening to the Holy Spirit and in our instance, following the Word of God. God sometimes tells you through your Scripture reading and through you studying the Bible and giving certain text that you are in to follow Him in this way. Hold your finger there and go to Acts 21. I want to remind you, we studied this several years ago in Acts, but it's worth uh, looking at it again. Acts 21. And again, Paul is going back on his third missionary journey, and he's traveling to these churches, and he's going back, uh, you know, backwards and, and looking at the churches themselves and all the leadership, making sure everything is okay. So he is traveling from Tyree. Look at verse 4. First, f- verse 4, Acts 21, 4. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. Then Paul, through the Holy Spirit, then they... They told Paul through the Holy Spirit not to go to Jerusalem, okay? That doesn't mean others can tell you God's will for your life. It's saying that there are times when God does put people in your pathway to tell you, you really need to consider this. You really need to think about it because we are the ones that make up our minds. We are the ones but I am telling you, we have a human nature. We can make mistakes when it comes to the will of God. Verse 5, and when he had come near the end of those days, we departed and we went on our way and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. Folks, the, the third thing, about knowing the will of God, you need to bathe it in prayer, okay? You need to listen to God. You need to listen to his word, and you need to bathe it in prayer. Now look down in verse 9. Now now there was a man, they, they left Caesarea, and it says, now there was a man who had four virgin daughters who prophesied. As we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, When he had come down uh, to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet. Thus saith the Holy Spirit. Number one, this guy was a prophet. Number two, he says, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you this. So uh, shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who holds the belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, we both... Uh, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Not once, but twice, someone told him, you don't need to go. And the second one was a prophet. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I understand what Paul is saying. He said, I'm ready to die. But you know something about dying? When you die, your ministry stops. Okay? Think about this. I'm not, again, folks are split on this. Scholars are split on this. But I believe, and you'll see this in just just a second, you'll see why I think it was the wrong decision. All right? For I'm ready, bound, but to die. So when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. Now go down to verse 30. Verse 30, Paul had went to the temple and he supposedly took Gentiles with him, which was not what he had done. And they arrested, they arrested him. Look at verse 30. And all the people was disturbed. And they ran together and seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came, uh, the commanders of the garrison, all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately... Uh, And he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they had saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. 
You say, Mike, why do you say that? Could, it, could he make a mistake? You know, what was his desire to go to Rome? But what, what, what happened? He was in jail, folks, for two years. And he had to appeal to Caesar. He still got to go to Rome. But he went there as a prisoner. He went there, and, and I was just thinking of possibly all the ministry that could have gone on if he would have listened to the Holy Spirit and listened to these people. And not, folks, it's not just people. Because the thing you have to do, even there are times when people are telling me things and telling me things, and when I get intense prayer and I ask for God's discernment, I don't do what they want me to do or think I should do. So really, the, 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 the deal comes back to, are you listening to God? Are you praying in the Spirit? Have you had confirmation from the Word of God? Because you will know if you know. And I'm telling you, a dead man, <laughs> I mean, God spared his life, and I understand God got him to Rome anyway, but not the way I believe he wanted to get him there. If he was a free man, I'm telling you, he could have went to the church of Rome. He could have uh, discipled them. It was already established, and there's no telling what all he could do. So I'm simply saying, Paul's plan and possibly, and again, I'm not saying I'm totally right and I know this. I'm just simply saying that there's a, a strong possibility that he should not have went to Jerusalem. Timothy could have took it. Titus could have took the, you know, and, and the deal that you'll see in the second point, he was concerned about the offering that was taken, which again is noble. It's, it's a good thing, but at the cost of what? And, and the possibility there is two years worth of ministry. So we see Paul's plan here. Now, the second thing I want you to see, not only Paul's plan, but Paul's purpose. Paul's purpose. Look at verse 25. And now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. And again, it's a great thing. Anytime we minister to one another and other churches, it's a great thing. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. And these Greeks, Greek Christians from these towns, had heard of the persecution in Jerusalem. They heard, uh, you know, that the church was having trouble, and it might even have been financial trouble. So they got together, and, and they would pull an offering, and when Paul would be in these churches checking on them, he would gather the offering, and he was gathering these offerings for the, uh, the Christian Jews in Jerusalem, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Verse 27, and it pleased them indeed, and they are, they are their debtors. Why did he call them debtors? Because if you think about it, folks, the gospel came to Jerusalem in the first place. The Acts 1 church, the Acts 2 church, it was located in Jerusalem. That started everything. And the gospel went out from there and went to the Gentiles. So in some ways, they, the Jews, the Christian Jews, were responsible for these other churches, all right, that were full of Gentiles that, again, were different than the Jews. Two sets of rules, two sets of things going. And one of the things that Paul wanted in his heart of hearts was for these two folks in these two Christian groups to get along, to love one another, to put aside their differences and be united and in one accord. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them in material things. Matter of fact, the church has allowed me to make the decision on whether we take up a love offering or not. And folks, I pray always seriously when it is presented to me. And I ask for God, God, you give me clear direction in this. I am responsible for this church. I am responsible for everything this church does. And I do not take love offerings lightly. I pray and I, I ask God, you tell me. And folks, what a love offering is. And again, I don't know, nobody's ever expressed this to me. But if you don't think we should give one to 
either a certain person or an individual or a needy family or that, then just don't give. Just don't give, okay? But so many times, folks, we are supporting missionaries. We are supporting hungry people. And I'll tell you, here's why we have the food banks. Because it's not the children's fault they're hungry. And as long as I'm pastor here, we will feed every child that we can possibly feed. Do we get feed out of some? Yes. Are there people taking advantage of the system? Yes. But I cannot lay in my bed at night thinking of a child that is hungry. I just can't. And so our love offerings are a gift to people and to ministers and to people who love God. Man, it does my heart so good when we take up love offerings for ministry. Verse 28, Therefore, when I've performed this, and I have sealed them uh, this fruit, I shall go by way of Spain to you. Again, three times in his text, I want to come to Rome. I want to come to Rome. I'm going to Spain. And again, folks, there's two different sides to whether Paul ever went to Spain. There's some that believe he went to Spain. My opinion is he did not go because I believe if he went, he would have wrote about it. Okay, he would specifically say, you know, this happened in my life. But he could have. All right, verse 29, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Let me show you what one of the churches uh, that gave a love offering uh, for these Christian Jews, uh, 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the church of uh, Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded the riches of their liberality. This church was it didn't have a lot of money. It was not flourishing financially. And folks, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm simply saying, you know, if we just give out of extra, of, you know, when we have extra, all right, God, I, you know, again, we, I know our prop, there's not a giving problem. Our church, we have met every need and everything, but the, the, The tithe is 10% of the income. An offering is anything over that that you want to give. That's what a free free will offering is. And so even these folks who did not have a lot, who, who had not known the Lord that long and that were strong in their faith, they were giving to a church that was in need. Verse 3, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Paul, you know, as far as the word went out, he said, hey, let's help these churches. But if you look at it from a human point of view, Paul might not have thought, well, we probably won't get much from that church. All right, they're struggling. They're struggling. But Paul is saying, man, was I shocked. I can't believe how these people love God, and they they gave to this offering and this free will offering. And it says, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Paul, come by here. Man, we got a check for you. We got money for you. We're so happy that we can help in this. And not only as we have hoped, but they first gave of themselves to the Lord. I am not kidding you. I'm telling you the truth. When I first came here, there were uh, people that said to me, you don't preach on money enough. You don't preach on tithing enough. And you know what my response to them was? If you get people in love with Jesus, they will tithe. Folks, I'm not here to raise money. That is not what I'm here for. We are here to share the gospel with everyone that we possibly can. We are here to help 
the needy and the hurting. That's what we are here for. And I'm simply saying, it is between, I have never, ever, ever in 19 years looked at anybody's giving record. I, I don't know who ties and who don't. I don't want to know. That's between them and God. And, but I'm telling you folks, God has blessed this church. And I tell you why God has blessed this church, because we are a giving church. You give from the heart. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Folks, it's the will of God that you tithe. It really is. And you can't outgive God. See, sometimes we think about what we will be missing, but I'm telling you, if you will get steady in it, if you will just keep giving, they gave from their hearts is what the Word of God is saying. So we urge Titus that he had begun so he would complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. So I'm just telling you folks, it's an honor to be able to give. It's an honor. To, you know, the first check we write in our home is the tithe to the church. And God has never let us down. You cannot outgive God. You will get a blessing from God. So again, Paul, very noble. He wanted to personally carry the offering to Jerusalem. But again, everyone, even in himself, as he looks at his prayer, you will see he even said there is much danger there, much danger. So we see Paul's plan. We see Paul's purpose. He had a good purpose. His motive was correct. But folks, we're talking about the perfect will of God. Is this for sure what God wants you to do? Paul's prayer. Look at the last scripture. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. When do we beg for things? <laughs> Think about it. Most of the time it's when we're desperate. Okay, when something's not going right, when there's something we really want, we really, really, really want. And let me tell you something, folks. I've learned this. Don't try to make deals with God. Listen to me. God's not in the deal-making business. God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Because you know why? Because he knows who you are. He knows your heart. And he knows, even though you say it, you probably are not going to do it. God knows you better than you know yourself, folks. So instead of making deals with God, just come under God's authority. And here's the problem we have. And wait for his answer. Do you realize part of waiting is part of Christian maturity? God can tell me something but it doesn't necessarily mean I'll get it right then. And we are the most impatient people. Watch people. Watch them at a red light. Okay? And if you take off when, when they're cutting through and it turns red on them and you take off, you're going to get blasted. Why? Somebody's in a hurry. Okay? We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait in restaurant lines. We don't like to wait for anything. I don't like to wait for my popcorn. It takes three minutes. And sometimes, listen to me, you miss the will of God because you won't wait. And man, we're hard. We're mankind. We're mankind. Our world is busy. It's going at warp speed, and so are we. So he said, I beg you, strive with me. And you know what striving is? It's a term, a, a Greek word called wrestling. And folks, I never wrestled. And you know why I never wrestled? One is you had to lose weight to wrestle. Okay? The other one is all they did was run. All they did, I looked at the wrestlers, and I played football, and I played baseball, and I played basketball, and I think, you don't even run that much in basketball. And everything was about weight and pulling weight. Put that same thing. And, no, and I'm not talking about this pro fake wrestling on TV, okay? 
That's ridiculous. I'm just saying that's ridiculous. I'm sorry. Don't mean to pop some of your bubbles. <laughs> but true wrestling is when it comes to the will of God, we should wrestle over it. We should take time to listen to God. It should. Do you realize sometimes prayer is prayer is a labor? When you seriously pray, pray. And folks, I've done, I've gotten up from certain prayer meetings and certain prayer times where I feel like I just walked three miles. That's what striving in prayer means. That's what how important the will of God is to Paul that I may be delivered from those in Judea. He tells you, I think I'm going to get, you know, arrested again. I think I may lo lose my life. So pray that that won't happen. And those in Judea who do not believe that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And again, I'm not saying it is wrong what he wrote. But folks, before it's acceptable to the saints, it needs to be acceptable to God to God, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Do you actually think that he was in chains and he was under house arrest that way? And again, folks, I, I've thought about it all week long. I hope you understand when I write a sermon, I write a sermon two to three weeks in advance. And when I have this week, and I had a whole lot more time this week to study because I was at the house three straight days. And I'm just saying, Paul had such desire. His desires, 95% of the time, were probably right. The other one, I totally, and I've always disagreed, over John Mark. He wasn't giving John Mark a break, okay? Again, it's just my opinion. But I'm simply saying, we miss the will of God when we don't wait on God. And when we're in the will of God, you know what we have in our life? We have joy. You know what we have in our life? Peace. You know what we have in our life? Rest. You know what we have in our life? Spiritual fulfillment. When we are in the direct will of God. Folks, I've been out of the will of God and probably everyone in this building has been, if you would just be honest, totally honest to God, and it is no fun. It is no fun. So it says that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now may the peace of God be with you all. Amen. All amen. Uh, Acts 20. I want to read both these. Hey, can I, can I go ahead and finish here? Is that okay? We may run a, a few minutes over. Everybody okay with that? Who said no? I heard, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Let me help you, all right? Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. From Miletus, we, le we left Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but pro proclaimed to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews, to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, his resume, I'm just telling you, all right? And it's, it, and even at this, folks, it wasn't easy for me to say this today because he's one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest church planters, one of the greatest, but he was not perfect. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things moved me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And folks, Paul is just saying, yeah, I probably have made some mistakes. I might not have always done it right. But I am telling you, I gave my all to Jesus Christ and to my Heavenly Father. I don't have regrets 
I'm not looking backwards. I am finishing my ministry. In 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, and we are finished with this. 2 Timothy 4, for I'm already, verse 6, 4, 6, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Oh, folks, I believe with all my heart, Paul did finish strong. He finished strong. And here's the deal, folks. Even if you miss the will of God, it's never too late to make things right. Even if you messed up years ago, and today God is saying, you know what? You need to fix this. You need to fix it. You need to make these things right. You need to. I'm telling you, God forgave Paul. God forgives me. God will forgive you. If you did the wrong thing, if you're in heart of hearts, and as you look back, and they say that hindsight's 2020, and I understand that. But God never leaves you or forsakes you. God never puts you over to the side and say, hey, you messed up. I'm not going to use you anymore. God can still use you. But one thing you must understand, you need to be saved. You need to be a Christian. If you are here today without Christ, that is the first decision that you need to be, make. And I'm telling you, the greatest decision a person can make is about their eternity. Knowing that they know that they know that they have accepted Jesus Christ into their life and their name was written in the Lamb's book of life. So today, I ask you, Christians, are you in the perfect will of God? Do you have God's peace in your life? Father, thank you for the day. And God, I thank you for Paul God, I know he finished strong. I understand he finished strong. God, I pray that we all would be in the perfect will of God. It is possible. It's even probable. Man, if we will just keep seeking you, if we keep walking with you, if we just stay beside you in your step, God, you're holding our hand. You're taking us towards the finish line. And God, I just pray, Lord, if there's anything that anyone here needs just to get right, maybe, maybe it's just to come to this altar in prayer, pray. Maybe they don't have to tell anyone else or want to tell anyone else. But God, if there's a profession of faith, if somebody's been saved, the Bible tells us you need to let people know. If we need to publicly rededicate our lives, I pray that we would do that or follow you in baptism or join this church, whatever, God, you tell them to do, God, I pray they would be obedient today. God, this is your church. This is your Holy Spirit. You are the ones that is moving, folks, during our invitation time. So, God, we're just going to get out of the way. We're just going to let you take over. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you for what you have done and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rahel Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.